and um, we want to find we uh, find ourselves tonight in Ephesians chapter four and verse three. Ephesians chapter four and verse three um, this is where we want to uh, invite you to tonight, and uh, let's see. Um, what this word from God is for us. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let us pray. Father, thank you for all of the wonderful things that you have done for us already. And we acknowledge and we honor you for uh, being so good to us, so merciful, so kind. Tonight, I ask that you would remember Pastor Scott and remember the wonderful people of St. John Church and that your spirit would rest mightily upon these moments that we spend together. Thank you even, Lord, for the Shiloh family who's come along to be a part of our gathering this week. And uh, bless us tonight. My prayer is that you would anoint my mind, my heart, and my mouth, that what I say and do tonight would bring honor and glory to your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, with your permission, um, saints of God, I would like to once again acknowledge the presence of the Shiloh family. There are a number of Shiloh people who have tuned in and are part of this gathering tonight. God bless you all, Shiloh. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I believe my wife is on. I would like for her to just chime in, say hello to everyone this evening. Sweetheart, if you're there. All right. I'm sorry. They wouldn't have let me unmute. <laughs> Here oh. I am. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be here one more time. Um, I thank God for my husband. Again, it is a pleasure to be here. Pastor Scott, it's good to see you. I'm glad to hear all is going well. Sisters and brothers in Christ, saints of the Lord, I love you and um, God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much, dear. Now, um, what we have said as it relates to our gathering, what we said is that <clears throat> the letter of Paul to the Ephesians is a um, it's a powerful message uh, that he delivers to those saints. And the underlying truth that Paul is uh, dealing with here is, in fact, unity. And what we've tried to do is show you uh, from the text of Ephesians, that um, unity, <clears throat> pardon me, is a priority for the apostle, but also, uh, and more importantly, is a priority for uh, the Godhead. In chapter one, we saw that the Godhead operates in unity. They are in agreement. And essentially, that's what the idea is uh, when we talk about unity, the idea is that they operate in agreement. Um, different roles, different responsibilities, and yet one in the actions that they take, all right? Um, and then chapter two, uh, the apostle Paul begins to outline for us the unity of the body of Christ in that um, in the church, what God has done is he has fixed it so by his spirit that the believers are, are, are one. And that's not a surprise for any of us in light of the fact that we were united when we were sinners. According to Ephesians chapter 2, Verses one to three, we were all in the same condition. So it doesn't matter who we were, where we came from, what color, what 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 uh, uh, social status we had. It didn't matter. 
all sinned and came short of the glory of God. And according to the, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, in time past, we all walked in the same way, all right? in a rebellion against God. And according to verse 3 of chapter 2, we were all under his wrath, identified as children of wrath every one of us. And so he saves us the same way that uh, uh, you got saved, I got saved, and every other person gets born again, uh, you know, is born again. And that is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and our faith in him, we're born again, right? So we're united already, united already. But now, <clears throat> and, and, and further, further, if, if you will allow me just to say this, um, Paul then, in the text of Ephesians, begins to um, offer some metaphors, some illustrations, some pictures of the um, believer's uh, life. Um, and he gives us four and shows us as the church. And the church is, Paul says, number one, chapter one, we're a body. In chapter two, we're a building, a spiritual building, but still a building, right? Then in chapter five, he says, we're a bride. And then chapter six, he says, we're a battalion. Now, in each one of those metaphors that Paul uses, unity is the critical point that's associated with each one of them. Unity, right? And in dealing with that whole picture of unity, we land by faith in chapter four, and we're at verse three. And the Apostle Paul says in verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 4, he says that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now watch, this is important. The word endeavor, um, it's endeavoring in verse uh, um, um, in verse three, it's endeavor. The idea is, here it is, to make the effort, to make the effort. It means to be diligent about making the effort, right? The word means to hasten, to make haste, watch, to exert oneself, to, to, to endeavor, to, to, to give diligence to, right? It literally means that what we ought to do is to do everything in our power to maintain this unity. Now, notice this, the language of verse three is important. The idea is that we are to be diligent. We are to make haste. We are to make every effort, right? To maintain the unity, watch this, of the spirit. Please notice the verse. Paul is not saying to us, that we are to maintain the unity of the church. It's not what he said. He doesn't say that we ought to maintain the unity of the pastor or the unity of the deacons. No, he says it's the unity of the spirit. Now, Here's the key to understanding 
unity as it relates to the life of a church. Watch. God is not expecting human beings to create unity. I need you with me. He's not expecting human beings to create unity. Watch this. Primarily because we can't. We are too corrupt in and of ourselves to produce unity amongst ourselves. We're too individualistic. We're too opinionated. Um, we are too selfish to want there to be unity in the fellowship. Watch. So we don't have that ability. God knows that. And so what he's done is given us the Holy Spirit who is the one who produces the unity. He produces it. He's the one that takes on the responsibility of making sure that unity is present in the church. He does, not us, he does. I need to reemphasize that point over and over and over again, because we need to get a hold of the fact before we can do anything, we need to understand that none of us have the ability to produce unity on our own. We don't have it. It's the unity of the spirit. He's the one that's producing the unity. Now, having said that, we are not supposed to produce the unity, but we do have the responsibility of maintaining it. We have the responsibility of being diligent about making sure that unity is seen and unity is experienced in the fellowship of the church. We have that responsibility. That word endeavor is huge in this passage, meaning that there is no human responsibility to produce the unity, but there is responsibility on us to maintain it. God holds us responsible to maintain it. Now, Paul lays out this issue strategically under the direction of the Holy Spirit, I might add, because after he talks about the unity of the Godhead in chapter one, and after he talks about the unity of the of the church in chapter two, right? He then lays out the responsibility of believers, right? And he begins dealing with this subject of unity okay now i gave you an outline the other night um we talked about the wealth the walk and the warfare of the believers as it relates to the book of ephesians and how paul lays it out i want to give you another outline of the book of ephesians that's going to help us a little more with our presentation tonight here it is Ephesians chapters 1 to 3 deal with the benefits of the saved. The benefits of the saved. Ephesians chapters 4 and 5 deal with the behavior of the saved. The behavior of the saved. Chapter 6 
Ephesians 6 deals with the battle of the saved. The battle of the saved. Right? Now understand this. If in chapters 4 and 5, you and I respond correctly to chapters 1 to 3. Chapter 6 says, you better know for certain that the enemy is going to get at you. Because the last thing that Satan wants is a body of believers who are, actu who are actually acting this way. All right? Now, watch this. In the behavior section of the book, after he's dealt with the benefits of chapters 1 to 3, he begins this behavior conversation. It lasts from chapter 4 all the way to the end of chapter 5 specifically. Now, here's the deal. If you and I have experienced the benefits of being saved, and according to the text of the scripture, we have. If we have experienced the benefits, all the benefits that Paul outlines in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3, then in chapter 4, Paul takes a turn and says, now, understand this. If you've experienced those benefits, then God expects them to impact how you behave and how you act. Chapter 4, we jump back down to verse 3. He says, endeavoring, making every single effort to keep, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that's the requirement. But notice that he doesn't lay it out officially until verse 3. Now, what that means is, beloved, that means you and I will never comprehend how to do verse 3 if we don't first grab the message of verses 1 and 2. So back up with me to Ephesians Chapter 4, verse 1. Notice what Paul says. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you or beg you, watch, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Vocation means job, responsibility, etc. Um. We have been called to something. And, and, and Paul is literally saying to us, you need to know that God puts, uh, puts value on you, high value on you. And if you are worth that much, then the very least that you can do is begin to act like it. Act like you are worth something. Act like you have value. And the way that you do that, watch, walk worthy of the called vocation, rather, wherewith you're called. How do you do that? Verse two, four things, he says. Number one, with all lowliness. Number two, with meekness. Meekness. It's all lowliness. The literal idea is all lowliness and all meekness. Right? And then he says, with long suffering. Right? And then he says, forbearing one another in love. Now, verse three helps us understand verse two in that. Verse 3 says that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, when he talks about this idea of the unity of the Spirit, understand this, that when he refers to the unity of the Spirit, he is only talking to 
and about the church. He's talking to and about the church, meaning that when he addresses these character issues in verse two, he's only referring to those persons who are born again, right? So when he says, in all lowliness and meekness, and he talks about long-suffering, and then he talks about forbearing one another, literally what he's saying is, all of these attitudes are to be directed toward other believers. In other words, this is the way we ought to view, this is the way we ought to deal with other believers, right? Now, the other thing that you need to grab a hold of in verse 2 is that all of these reflect a major attitude adjustment. For any of this to go down, there must be attitude adjustments in the fellowship of the church. We have to stop. Um, well, no, 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 let's do it this way. Oftentimes, the way we see or handle or deal with other people oftentimes is a reflection of how we see ourselves or what we think of ourselves. What Paul is doing here is he's saying there needs to be an adjustment, attitude adjustment, and if, in fact, you're going to deal with other people this way, then honestly, you have to adjust how you see yourself. All right? So there are two dynamics in this verse that you can't see, um, you know, straight up, but they're there. And that is, when he talks about lowliness and meekness, and he talks about um, long suffering, and he talks about um, uh, this idea of forbearing, right? Um, two issues here that happen in the life of people, and and they're oftentimes seen in the church. Sometimes people deal with people, and they deal with them hostile because of they devalue themselves. They don't think much of themselves. And in light of the fact that they don't think much of themselves, they don't think much of other people. But then the other side of it is, is that while some people devalue themselves, there are others who overly value themselves. You think more of yourself than you ought to think. And if you are of a mindset that you deserve better or more, I don't mean like that. If you think that you deserve more, um, then maybe you're in the category of thinking more of yourself than you ought to think. Now, I don't mean like I'm saying it. I don't want anyone in here tonight to, to leave this place thinking that I am telling you that you ought not think highly of yourself in that you ought not, you know, uh, look at yourself as being of any value. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to you that there's a danger of either devaluing yourself or overly valuing yourself, Right. The issue is where you need to land is you must see yourself how God sees you now. How God, because God highly values you, but he highly values you because of what he has done for you and not what you have done for yourself. Very important. Okay? Now, let's do this. Let's talk about these four things to kind of 
deal with them so we can get through what we need to get through. All right. Where do we begin? We begin where Paul begins. Lowliness. What exactly are we talking about when we talk about this idea of lowliness? What 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 exa what exactly does the apostle Paul have in mind? Okay. Um, I, I was brief with you all uh, this week, and, and I need you to kind of bear with me tonight because I'm, I'm not going to be long, but I want to be clear and I want to be accurate. All right. When we talk about this idea of lowliness, what are we literally talking about? Literally, the idea of lowliness is this. It means humility of mind. Humility of mind. It speaks directly to the issue of how we see ourselves. What do we really think of ourselves? And again, I'm not saying don't think anything of yourself. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that if you overly evaluate, overly value yourself you will be in the position of thinking you deserve more and whenever you don't get it you're going to react to it and wherever it's the context is it shows up now the immediate context here is not the world, it's the church. So Paul is dealing specifically with how we treat one another, how we see and interact with one another. It begins, beloved, with lowliness, and that is a humility of mind, a humbleness of mind right? It is having a humble opinion of your own self. And you don't get that if you think you're doing anything on your own. It begins with a right um, mindset of what God has done. That's why the Apostle Paul um, in our Bibles he spends the first three chapters dealing with what God has done, the benefits that God has given to every Christian um, who has come to him by faith. So lowliness of mind. Now, the idea, get this, the idea is important because lowliness literally, um, you know, will express itself. Paul is talking about an outward expression of your inner perspective, an outward perception, or an outward expression of your inner perception, how you see yourself, all right? That's lowliness. But now, meekness, meekness. Pardon me, I find that Paul is interestingly dealing with these two things together because the truth of the matter is, is that they, they're synonyms, they're kind of close to each other. But it's interesting because here's the idea. Um, if you have the right view of yourself, meekness says it will express itself, watch this, with gentleness in how you deal with other people. It will be, watch this, mildness. Now, <clears throat> understand this, that in the New Testament, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. Please understand that. The meekest man 
who ever lived before Jesus Christ himself, the testimony from Jesus is, is that the meekest man that ever lived was Moses. Think about that. Think about Moses. God used him because he was faithful and committed to God. He used him to open the Red Sea. He used him to bring water from a rock. He used him to pray and bread came down from heaven. He prayed again and God sent quail through the camp of his people. It is doubtful that any person living at that time would have called Moses weak. He was not weak. He was meek because he endured some rough times with the people of God. They were hard headed, stiff necked, didn't want to you know, do right, didn't want to serve, didn't want to obey, didn't want to follow his lead. And all Moses did was pray for them. He prayed for them. There are moments when God sent judgment, but for the most part, Moses prayed for them. Meekness, beloved, one of the hardest lessons that I have had to learn through my life is that New Testament meekness is not weakness. You don't lose anything as a child of God by being meek. Actually, according to the record of scripture, you gain. You gain. The text says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. We don't lose anything by being meek. We gain. We gain. So he says that we are to be lowly of mind. And that will be express itself. That attitude, that inner attitude will express itself through gentleness in terms of how we handle and deal with others. But then the third thing is this, it's specifically directed toward other people with long suffering. Now, long suffering literally is patience under pressure. It's patience under pressure. And the idea there is that we are patient while we are enduring evil. The fundamental issue is that we want to give people back what they give to us. If that's your mindset, there will never be unity in the church. Never be unity in the church. Why? Because within the context of, you know, being with other humans, other humans, they're going to do what they do. People are going to be people. They're going to do what they do. If you don't believe that, when they get to heaven, ask Jesus about his own disciples. There was more fighting and arguing more debating and foolishness in that group. And Jesus was present with them. He was present. He was there. And they were debating about who's going to be the greatest. Uh, if you remember, at some point, they even had a debate about chief seats. Right? Who's going to sit to his right and his left and all that kind of craziness. And Jesus was with them. So as long as we are in these bodies, human beings are going to be human beings. 
they are who they are. Our responsibility is not to dictate to any human being how we ought to be. Our responsibility is for us to be what we're supposed to be in spite of how other folk are being. Now, I know there are probably some teachers online, you know that was a terrible sentence, terrible sentence structure, but hopefully you got my point. But hopefully you got the point. All right, now, <clears throat> here we go. Lowliness, meekness, we're talking about working together in unity. You're not going to be able to do this. You're not going to be able to do that if you don't commit yourself to this. Lowliness of mind, meekness in dealing, watch this, long suffering, and that's patience under pressure. Stay with me. It's only one more. He says forbearance. Forbearance. Now that's an interesting word because we are, the text says we are to forbear. Watch. We are to forbear one another in love. So there's a context in which it ought to happen. Right? He says um, that we ought to forbear one another. Watch. The idea means, excuse me, it means literally to put up with. Another word would be tolerate. Put up with, to tolerate. All right, watch. It means, it carries with it the idea of, <clears throat> sorry, it means to hold yourself up against one, to forbear. In other words, everyone is not going to see things the way you do. You know that before they do it. When you run into someone like that and they kind of rub you the wrong way, Paul says, your natural reaction is going to be separate yourself from them. But instead, forbearing means, listen, it literally means to get alongside them, rub up against them instead. Hold them up, bear them up. It could be that the people that you're dealing with are dealing with some of the same issues that you are but you're further along than they are. Question becomes, how'd you get where you were? Because God came alongside you by his spirit. He came alongside you and he held you up. And I, I don't want to use it this way, but you understand what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit puts up with us. That's not what he does. But understand this. He puts up with us. He loves us but he puts up with us and has committed himself to follow the words of Jesus, never to leave us or forsake us. Now, watch this. And I've been up here too long. Watch. Here's what he says. If we are committed to have a lowness, lowliness of mind, if we are committed to meekness, and that is gentleness in our dealings I'm sorry, with other believers. If we are committed to exercise patience, pardon me, under pressure, while we are under pressure, and if we are committed to this idea of putting up with one another, and getting alongside them and holding them up, bearing them up. If we're committed to that, then Paul says, we are then able, watch, to do the thing that we need to do to make diligent efforts to maintain the unity of the spirit 
in the bond of peace. God is willing to bring us to the place that we have everything that we need, but he expects us to do the work necessary to maintain unity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done and for your spirit and your word tonight. Sanctify your truth to the hearts of the hearers, and we will bless and praise you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the opportunity. Saints, God bless you.